Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Anjali Bastian Pillai. I work for Picta Asset Management. We uh, run these um, huge funds which are uh, focused on uh, long term thematic uh, investing, and uh, they launched one of the very first security funds, well, the very f first security fund out there, uh, which is called Security. Uh, it's protecting, uh, so any company that in, um, is focused on protecting the integrity, the safety of people, companies, and countries um, are invested in that fund. The fund is over $5 billion now. Uh, we launched it in 2006, so uh, there's so much has changed since then, and it's very much driven by long term secular trends, and that includes urbanization so smart cities, innovation, and um, the third one is regulation. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much uh, what I cover at the moment. I have my own. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Israel Baron. I'm the director uh, of business uh, development at uh, Cervelo. Cervelo is a cybersecurity company focused on uh, protecting the railway industry, uh, railway uh, secure, uh, secured operation centers. And before that I was uh, in uh, Israel uh, Railways. I was the first CISO, I established uh, the cyber department in the company, and before that I, I used to work for many years in the Israeli Ministry of uh, Defense. Hello everybody. Oh, maybe you see us? Okay. Hello Is that better? Yes, it yes. is. Hi everybody, I first want to say something very different. I'm super happy to be here. I've arrived like 24 hours ago, and I'm overwhelmed with the beauty and energy of the city. You know, on the first trip I did with my friend Effie, I saw him earlier, he took me, there he is, he took me to Jerusalem last night and I just returned. So I'm, I'm really amazed and then we have this kind of whiskey reception. So I'm, I'm not sure what's going on, but I will probably stay here if, if I can. Eh? So anyway, my name is Andreas Stoeklin. I, I work for Duff & Fabes. We are a global um, advisory firm. We do corporate finance, valuation and risk management, in particular cybersecurity. I'm not from the cybersecurity area or domain. Maybe I should, but I'm not. So I work in the M&A advisory business, and we advise companies in merging and in acquisitions, and very often in industries and technology. And so I spent a lot of time in the mobility space and recently advised Daimler and BMW, two really all-time rivals in the industry, to merge their global mobility ventures into one combined unit. And I'm based in, in Frankfurt and living before Munich. Nice to meet everybody and looking forward to the discussion. Hello, everyone. I'm Olivier Dalois. I'm a Chief Information Security Officer for a company named Forosia. Forosia is more or less uh, building seats for cars, interiors of cars, also what we call clean mobility. This is um, uh, hydrogen tanks and exhaust pipes and so on. And recently, we acquired three companies Parrot, Coagen, and Clarion. Probably at least some of you can remember the Clarion, the nice other radios, blue other radios. So we are now in the electronic business of what is inside a car. And the cars are going to be connected to, first of all, your smartphone. And obviously nobody is going to be uh, willing to refrain from connecting those smartphones to the cars. But the cars are going to connect also to other cars so that one can tell the other one, I'm passing you, please let me come in front of you back, and so on. But the cars are also going to be connected to the clouds. And all of that, the idea, again, is that your car is going to be the new way for you to be able to live far from your business without being annoyed by the traffic jam. You're going to be able to work, you're going to be able to eat, and you're going to be able to sleep in your car. So you're going to be able to live one hour away from your business without any impact on your daily life. But in order to do that, you're going to have to secure the whole thing. And this is my goal. So I'm in fact responsible for the production of IT, the production of OT, meaning the plants, that's internal business. And I'm also responsible for, for protecting the products and services of Forisia, meaning the OT, the electronics of the car, and the IT, the programs in the car and the connection to the clouds. Welcome to a new risky and very interesting world. Yeah, it's working? Okay. <laughs> My name is Eldad Raziel. I'm leading the cybersecurity at the Innovation Lab in Israel, um, the Alliance Innovation Lab, Renault Nissan Mitsubishi. Um, we are focusing on cybersecurity and another pillars that cause sensors and AI and smart cities. Um, one, on, one of my, let's say, focus and goals are to scout the ecosystem 
to look at cybersecurity solutions, to analyze them, and to push them to the corporate. I have a vast experience of 13 years in cybersecurity and information security, working in several domains, and for sure this is a fascinated world that we need to be in. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna use, yeah, this one's still on, brilliant. Thank you very much for everybody's interest. So, I will start off, let's, let's throw the crystal ball out to the future for a little bit. What I'd love to talk about, I mean, quick, quick show of hands. Um, how many of you own your own car? How many of you ride those bloody crazy scooters? All right, we'll have a conversation afterwards about what you can do with one of those in an RFID chip. Stop them. <laughs> oh, I know, yeah. So this is something which I'm really intrigued about. We talk about vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to pedestrian, vehicle to infrastructure technology. And there's a lot of discussion about the future of transportation. And maybe we won't own our own cars. We'll walk up, we'll borrow one, steal one. If we're hackers, we'll just whatever we want to do. How far do you think we have to move the technology? Are we five years out, 10 years, 15? And we have business people who are thinking about the investments for this. We have an amazing, you know, you guys produce some amazing stuff. You have to think five, 10, 15 years out and the same thing. So I would love if each one of you could just spend a couple of minutes talking about what your vision is and maybe how long it's gonna be before we get to that vision of the future where we can ignore the flying car for the minute, but really where we don't necessarily own it and we integrate more effectively with the city around us. So again, ladies first, please. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not putting no, you on the spot, no, but no, no, I am. No problem, I mean, um, so we, we have a, a portfolio with some uh, company names that actually have, uh, if you want, created this whole kind of software around your car. I mean, we go, we invest in, in um, companies that produce the semi-chip conductors that go into the software, into the cars, uh, versus all the way to, um, you know, Continental AG, for example, acquiring like a cybersecurity company to, to help the whole cybersecurity within your car. I think there are two issues is one is the latency and second is the compute power. So latency, even if you have 5G, etc., like, you know, how quickly can you go back to the cloud and collect data and, and try and, you know, get the car to move, actually, if you want to as fast as possible, and how much do you actually compute within the car? So uh, we look at all these aspects, but I think clearly there's one big issue, which is protocol. Like, you know, if there's an accident or whatever, who gets charged first? The software in the car, the person who's driving, um, you know, the latency between retrieving data. Um, so is it the driver, the car, is it the software? All these questions need to be addressed. And I mean, there's one example out there which everybody's seen, which is Waymo, among others, but you see how they interact with the, the DMV in California, but um, they, they had a very public um, uh, kind of discussion, and of course it was all very negative, a lot of pushback, and then you go back more recently, and they get more and more approvals, or they're getting closer to the approval, but it's a state by state just in the US, so how is it gonna work like all over uh, the rest of the world? So I don't wanna hawk too much, but from our perspective, there's a lot in terms of protocol, in terms of compute power, in terms of latency, like how is this all gonna work? And it's not just the car itself, but at a certain point, you need to also, uh, car or other devices, you need to connect to a grid or connect to, you know, if it's to go and park the car, etc. There needs to be some connection with everything around in terms of infrastructure. So we feel like we're a long ways away, but it's also the way it's being set up. Um, either there's too many companies with a lot of power, whether it's Uber, um, uh, Waymo, uh, with Alphabet or Google, um, that concentration, I think, makes it harder sometimes to figure out, you know, how this is all going to work out and may slow down the whole process. And you can see that in the U.S. with all the antitrust issues, right? So if very few, um, and you see it with the IPOs as well, which is very important for us. We don't invest in those IPOs because the valuations are so high. Um, and it's very hard to see the business model and how profitable it's going to be. But the reality is the IPO is high because there's just very few um, big companies that do that. And it's all related to how much data you have in, in order to get to what we call level five today. Um, and we're only in, in, in today's world a level two and just on the cusp of level three. Could you? So, I don't wanna, so no, no, no. Actually, that's a really good point. Time, would you mind? How many, how many of you here understand the level one, two, three, four, five? 
Oh, right. sorry, would sorry. You, let no, me, no, 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 perfectly. Would you mind? Oh, under, would somebody mind want, just explaining that? Do you want me to explain it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, basically, we, we every car pretty much has level one today. Level two is the standard. Level three, I'm sure you heard about the Audi A8. They made a lot of uh, noise about it. It, it. We're at the cusp of that. Level four is where your car starts to drive a little bit on its own. And level five, it's completely autonomous. And um, the level five kind of uh, aim of like a Waymo, and I don't want to hawk on too many big names like that, but that's what they're aiming for. For. You have um, Uber, you have Tesla. Uh, the way they do it's all very different, but the, to get there, the aim is to really have a fully autonomous car. In order to do that, um, a, a lot of the chip makers are already planning for that. So you have NVIDIA Drive, for example. NVIDIA has a huge issue, even if you have 5G around, which is another issue, like how you know, how much infrastructure cost you're going to have to have in order to have a, le a level 5 Waymo car. It's a lot. So an NVIDIA, for example, they'll start with their, uh, their chip called NVIDIA Drive, but they'll tell you latency is a big issue. Like you have to go back and get stuff from the cloud. You can't drive the car and do that. You can maybe do speech like, you know, oh, you know, turn on my AC or whatever you want. But the actual compute power of the car needs to be taken into account. And I don't, I mean, I'll pass you the, the mic, but I don't think we're at that level yet. Um, but having said that, to get to level five, you need to accumulate a lot of data. And you've seen these little cars all around, maybe you've seen it on YouTube, but all around Silicon Valley, like the little, <laughs> the little Playmobil cars, they're just collecting, collecting data to try and machine machine learn and be able to, to auto drive it, you need to do miles and miles. So all these cars today, I mean, they launched one, uh, Google launched one in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. It's not driverless. There's technically a safety driver, basically who slams the brakes if there's like a, a serious problem among other things, but they all have safety drivers in them. They're not actually fully driverless. And then the question is how much connection you'll need to a grid system in terms of you're your driving with people who are not driving or people who are also driving next to you. Um, it, it, it's, it's a long ways away, that's what we think, but it's, it's, there, there's lots of questions about protocol, like if you have an accident, is it the software, the car, the infrastructure cost, the latency, how much do you have to go and retrieve and bring, bring back to the car, and the actual compute power in the car, because the, com the car is going to have to think in terms of accidents, but also drive, so that, that's our issue. Who's up next? Let's have, actually, let's have a technical part. When we'll go technical, business, technical, business, technical, business, technical. Okay. So I think... Everybody's um, being too polite. <laughs> <laughs> so I think nobody has the crystal um, to tell what is going to be the future and when that is going to be. But that is, what is for sure is that today, more or less, we are putting all the efforts on connecting, again, the, the car, the seat, for, first of all, to the phone and the seat to the interior electronics in front of you. Um, these are most of the efforts that all, mostly all of the companies are doing today. And that, for that, typically, the, let's say, some of very advanced models should be issued within, well, let's say, three to five years. I, I would say some are already going to be before that, but it's going to be a very, very uh, cost uh, car, a lot of, uh, very expensive car. Um, now, after that, what is going to come is that you're going to have the connection from the car to the cloud. And that, that could bring also the computing power that you will need in the car to really enjoy, I mean, you know, whatever you can have in your car in terms of IT. Basically, in front of you, you're going to have a couple of Androids. When I say a couple, maybe three, four, depending. So you're going to be, you're going to have, you're going to be able to watch a movie typically in one of the seats, watching another movie in another seat, having another sound, and maybe having your own temperature and all of that stuff. Stuff. And having also cameras uh, looking at the temperature of your face, either, either you're smiling or you're not smiling, and depending on that, the, uh, the driving attitude of the car is going to change. This is the very the, the second step, I would say. And the third step is going to be about autonomous driving. Now, the uh, very interesting part is that, I don't know if you know, but the, the most difficult thing we have today in order to have an autonomous car is more or less to turn the seat, the driver's seat. Because in the middle, you have the console. And and that you cannot take it away. 
because keep in mind that a lot of people want to be able to buy a car that they don't drive, but if they want to drive it, come back to the, to the steering wheel, they want to be able to do that without stopping the car. And we are able today to turn the front seat by 20 degrees maximum, more or less. Now, the challenge is to completely move it, move it around. And again, believe me, this is, it, it sounds interesting because we all believe it's going to be electronics or legal or whatever. But first, this very first issue, because if you have to, to, to stay in front of, the, of the, um, the road, then there is no interest in having an autonomous car, basically. Again, you want to eat, you want to sleep, you want to whatever in your car, watch movies. So that requires your seat to be able to move. So autonomous driving will probably not be before, let's say, 10 years. Um, I'd say, again, coming to level five, I, I would say that requires at least 10 years. But again, nobody can, can say whether that is going to be true or false. We'll see. But that's cl clearly the most advanced thing you know, that we would be looking at in a car. Awesome. Thank you. That was, yeah. Let's take another business view, and then we'll go back to we technical again. Yeah. Maybe I start with, uh, you know, one of our ex chancellors he, he said, are really try to avoid making predictions, even more when it relates to the future. So, and the other thing he said was, you know, if I have a vision, I go to see a doctor. So, I mean, it's, you put a really hard question out there, and even more for, for a business guy, but let, let me try to address it. So, what I think is really, you know, and you can read it, a lot of people think we are like an, at an inception point when it comes to mobility. But, but why a point? I mean, such a massive transformation will take, you know, decades yeah. to kind of evolve and transpire. So, uh, and everybody really uh, tries to reserve a seat, you know, on future mobility, being it the OEMs or, or the tech giants, because the, the market opportunity out there is so significant, so massive, and so is also the pain with uh, some of the incumbents to deal with that change. Yes. Um, you know, research from Goldman Sachs kind of suggests that only in the last four years, 100 billion of US dollars of VC fundings went into that mobility domain. And mobility kind of defined very broadly, including ride hailing, car sharing, but also micro mobility, scooters you touch upon, and also, you know, flying taxis, if you like, so quite broadly. What you see is that not only a lot of funding goes into that market, but also this kind of, you know, ecosystem accumulates significant and massive operating losses, you know, year over year. So much cash is being burned, and now with some of the uh, recent IPOs we have seen, you know, from Uber and, and Lyft and other ride-hailing companies, a lot of people in the industry believe there's a trend towards more, you know, profitability. And how to kind of create profitability with increasing prices, which has been one of the kind of fuels for growth, because it's very convenient and it was, you know, just affordable. And it was safe to a certain extent. Right. And now with the increase of prices and being more, you know, profitability driven and creating operational synergies, that will disappear. So it will really be interesting to see if that will delay then the transformation, which I believe or not. But, but to kind of be shortened on the point, I think the opportunity is massive and in a lot of these fields. Awesome. That, I think thanks. we need to mention as well the mass transportation systems because thank we you. are talking about cars, but what about planes? What about trains? Yep. You know, as of today, many of the trains are already autonomous. Many of the planes have automatic pilots. And we already showed that, let's say, in the railway industry, which I come from, the, all the systems are not secured at all. I mean, you look at technology that was developed 20 years ago, and even technology which is developed now for the next 20 years, it's not uh, secured against cyber threats. And uh, we already proved that you can move a switch in front of a moving train. <laughs> Meaning that, you, let's say you, you are talking about a car, one car. Okay, so one car will have an accident too. On each train, you have thousands uh, of people. And uh, in Japan, for example, the, the railway is moving like in 300 kilometers per hour. You know, an accident like that, it's like a ballistic missile. Yeah. If something like that went uh, off, off tracks. And it's, it's amazing today because you sit on a, on a train, you have the Wi-Fi system, which is, you know, you have the passenger information system and you have your ent entertainment system and everything is connected together. And you can basically hack your way through the Wi-Fi of the passenger <laughs> to the signaling system on board of the train. Okay. And when you speak with the OEMs and the manufacturers, 
they don't uh, seem to realize that. They tell you, look, it's safety system, it's a closed network, nobody can hack it, but Chris, you know. <laughs> Hold that <laughs> thought. Do we, who's here from the US? Or who's ever ridden an Amtrak train in the US? Can you turn that? Yeah, let's not record this part, please. <laughs> Do we have anybody from the railway network in the US before I say what I'm going to say? <laughs> yeah, they're hiding, they're hiding. Now. <laughs> yeah, they're hiding. So next time you're in the US, you can hook up to the Amtrak railway network. They still have shell shock running on their switches. Their switches get you to the engine compartment. So if you're late, you can speed the damn thing up. If you need the user ID, user ID on the track side is user ID GE, password GE, or password 001. Have at it. Back to you. But no, by, but I have to admit that uh, I, I remember it was uh, like two years ago when I, used, uh, I worked in the Israel Railways. I got my first car there. It was a Kiev Portage. And I took her home and I was driving uh, the highway. And then I tried to switch the lanes, and I didn't uh, use the, the blinker, how do you call it, the, the switch. And the car immediately brought me back to track. And I said, oh my god, what is this? It controls the wheel, you know? It, it was very frightening, I have to admit. And I, I immediately thought, what if someone hacks my Wi-Fi, because I was connected to it using my cell phone, what if someone will drive by me, hack uh, his way to my cell phone, and control my dr driving wheel? So I, I didn't tell my wife about it, so <laughs> she doesn't know how to kill me. Actually, can I inject it? So, quick show of hands for a second. How many of you travel on the Israeli rail system? And to wow. your point, it's semi-autonomous and everything else. So everybody's comfortable about a semi-autonomous train, yes? Same thing at the airports, the trains at the airports. How many of you, quick show of hands, how many of you would be comfortable, say in the next 12 months, getting on to an, into an autonomous car? Come on, you all know you want to try it. Nobody's going to crash too badly. All right, how many of you want to jump onto an autonomous plane? All right, game in. Sweet, thank you. Brave <laughs> people. Drones don't count, by the way. We already know we have problems with those bloody things. All right, I apologize, no. go for it. So, one of the research that I am familiar with because I read it, um, talk about 200 million vehicle, connected vehicle by the year of 2020. So, I don't know about you, but the risk and the vulnerability on, on the connected car and for sure about the future vehicles will be more and more and more vulnerable because as much as we are exposing services, the vehicle will be vulnerable. So for sure, you can attack the vehicle from each and every side. And when you are talking about one vehicle, I'm talking about fleet attack. And fleet attack, when you are, when you are attacking the cloud and you can gain the access to the full fleet, Eventually, you can get access on your all kind of brand that you have on your OEM. So eventually, our vehicle can be vulnerable, but you need to put some layers of solution, layers of cyber solutions. But for sure, you can put some cyber solutions in the vehicle. For sure, you can put some cyber solutions on the cloud. You will need to see if your line or your pipeline can be compromised or not. What you are sending to the cloud, how you want to detect the, the, the vulnerability, and how you want to attack the cyber attack. So for sure you will have a lot of issues in the future. And if we are talking about level four and level five, autonomous vehicle, robot taxis, um, this is the future for sure, but we need, to think, we need to think about it. And when we are talking about predicting, predict it or uh, talking about the future and what will be yeah we can yeah. we can look at, at the, the timeline but for sure we can also that familiar makes, with it yeah the, it's going to be a challenge on that yeah. one go for it so you were going to yeah just one, one more word uh, i think we all know that the uh, the most difficult part in cybersecurity is when you take a system that was completely closed not open to anything <laughs> and people were not even designing it conceiving it so that it can be open and secure by the way, does it remind, remind some of you about internet? Well, this is exactly the same thing for cars. I mean, the cars were not meant to be connected to anything, not even smartphones, because cars existed 
just a lot before the smartphones and not to the clouds and not to other cars. So now we are taking a system that was already existing and trying to secure it, not by design. I mean, by design, of course, for the solutions that we're building, but the cars that we're taking were not by design secure. So the difficulty is to introduce cybersecurity by design in something that was not at all meant to be secure against anything coming in. I, yeah. I think you need to, to work in two vectors. One is to patch all the, of the old systems. It's the same on, on railways, okay? You have to patch all the old systems and you have to be prepared for the, for the future systems and make security by design to those uh, systems. And when you talk to the OEMs, I, I, I just have the feeling that everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything. You know, you, you can read many articles on LinkedIn, on the, on the risks, but what about actual actions? Well, that, so that's an interesting point. Uh, back to your point, 200 million vehicles connected by 2020. That's great. Now, let's fast forward to 2025, and you have to issue, issue a patch to those 200 million vehicles. How the hell do you do it? Over the air. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question. Show of hands. How many of you care about privacy? Uh, okay. How many of you care about convenience? Which one do you prefer? <laughs> yeah. Uh, nice. Can't have cake and eat it. Cake is a lie. Can't have both. That's my question. This is going to be an interesting one for, for you. We talk about 200 million connected vehicles. We talk about the autonomous. We talk about having to have these huge data lakes or data swamps of, of stuff that we can't even ask the right questions of. How does everybody here protect everybody here? Any thoughts on that one? I'm totally throwing this one open to everybody here. Any thoughts on that one? How do we make sure that when I do break in, and let's face it, we're going to, how do I make sure I don't get everybody's intelligence or I don't take all the information or I can't use and abuse it in the same way that I've been able to for the last 20 plus years? Any thoughts on that one? I mean, I can start, yeah. I think the others probably have a better view, but, but um, it, it all starts with awareness. Um, there's, a, a great, uh, there's a great piece by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, exactly about what you said. When you ask everybody, you know, are you, you concerned about safety, security, super high, yeah, yeah. and then when you ask them about convenience, then they actually track it and show you how, because of convenience, people are letting go on security. And the best is usually with kids, like when they see a Starbucks in Europe or the US, it's free Wi-Fi, right? But it's the bed, like a hotbed for like being hacked into two seconds flat, right? And so the awareness is a bigger issue, I think. And especially not just with like an Amazon Echo or whatever that tracks all your your data, just whatever you say in there, it's just constantly collecting data, tagging. And when I talk about machine learning, it's all about that, whether you like it or not, Facebook, etc. they're collecting all sorts of data they possibly can and increase their machine learning so they can be better tag and advertise to you through algorithms that are super intelligent today. So I think first of all, it's raising awareness and the younger you are, the, the more I think you need that awareness raised. Um, but second, it's also just realizing that there is a cost for that security. And I think making that security cost cheaper is the only way for people to, to be more aware and, and, and be careful about not constantly using free Wi-Fi everywhere and wherever they can. That's one aspect of it and we see that a lot. But the other part also is I think um, the, the, there's infrastructure again, I don't want to go back constantly to that, but there's just so much infrastructure available everywhere in different countries, but there is no regulation or no standards whatsoever. And over time, I think a corporate rating is going to become almost weaker or less important than a, a, a cybersecurity rating. I think that's where you can impose that awareness in a certain way, but a, 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 a cybersecurity rating over time is going to be so important for, for companies who so you've heard of GDPR probably in Europe. As of May last year, there's the huge repercussions for companies that don't take care of data safety and data security and uh, from Facebook to Google, well, Facebook for data breaches, they've been hit very solidly in in, in Europe, and it's now obviously going to go towards the U.S. as well. But I think the cybersecurity rating, the awareness, the the, the just making people, um, uh, in a way, reduce the cost for people to be able to secure themselves. I think is the three ways we see that. Uh, I would like to ask a question: How many of you have a car with two external mirrors and more than two airbags? 
who would like to come back to no airbags and no external mirrors or one only? I believe none of you. So it's going to be the same thing. Well, okay, let's try. <laughs> so I think it's going to be exactly the same thing for autonomous cars or cars connected and so on. The, the condition to do anything in a car is to have a car secure. Otherwise, nobody will look at any feature, either you know, even fancy features. Nobody will look at them if first it's not secure. When I mean my secure, it's you, it, you cannot hack into the car and you cannot access the data into the Don't car. Don't tell me I can't hack being, something. Yeah. Don't tell me I can't hack well, something. Well, challenge accepted. I, I, there will be always vulnerabilities, but at least you make sure that you did everything you could so that nobody can do it. This is going to be reduced the condition risk. to bring reduce risk. Yes, absolutely. There we go. Sorry, uh, we all know this. Nothing is safe. Ish. <laughs> all right, go for it. Any other thoughts on this one? Any other thoughts? Come on, we got Reno here. How are you going to protect everybody's information? Carefully. <laughs> Maybe the only thought I have, and I really like kind of your presentation, Mark, which was really entertaining but also insightful. Uh, and some of the advice you provided, it seemed for somebody who's not really coming from that uh, technology angle, pretty basic, I would say. And even some of the screenshots reminded me on, on the time when I bought my first Commodore 64. <laughs> but still, with your example, I mean, it's amazing how uh, the awareness is not there and that people really don't act or, or implement actions to prevent that. And I read, you know, before coming here, that it takes still over 100 days until, you know, some attack will be detected, and then you can see how you sort it out. And, and we as a firm definitely perhaps we help on that. But it still, I mean, it must be an hour of, of hours or, or days, but not 100 days of, after something is found out. So it's pretty amazing for me as an outsider to the industry, to be honest. I think part of it, so part of that, and this is where you come into it, is as technologists and as IT and information security people, we unfortunately, part of it's business driven and part of it's us driven, we've spent so long chasing the next technology. You know, it was, hey, we'll put a firewall in, we'll all be safe. We'll put IDS, IPS in, we'll all be safe. We'll put DLP, in, and it's bullshit. You cannot stop somebody from getting in. What you can do is, as soon as somebody's in, what's the awareness? What do you have from detection, deception, predictive side of it that helps you understand what's going on? And quite honestly, it's to me, it's back to the basics. Why the hell are you chasing technology when you still have remote desktop protocol open on the internet? Why are you still chasing technology when you have user ID Cisco, password Cisco on your sodding firewalls? Or you let the vendor leave your company's site and they've left defaults on Taser the buggers. If, if I may, you still need uh, time and budget. Uh, if you, if uh, all the OEMs release cars just like that with a lot of fancy features, connected cars, it's going to be just a mess. If nobody is willing to pay for any security, like you don't pay, you don't get any airbags. You don't pay, you don't get any mirror. You have to pay for it and it has to be part of the car and you, all the customers have to accept it, meaning all the customers m should care for what kind of cyber security certification or whatever has been performed is before that up it has to been us released. to help educate them how do, and this is a good question for you how do we educate everybody here and everybody's grandmother and mother and kids about safety and about how we protect the systems i'm gonna throw that one at you sorry yeah give some thoughts you've been quiet i'm going after you are you gonna have whiskey if you want <laughs> I will address to that with um, my thoughts because eventually the OEM is a traditional industry and for sure for the OEM in order to let go of the release cycle of uh, over five years and more, um, it's a pain. And uh, in order to be that, they need to go over it and to be agile and for that we are exist, the innovation lab. And for sure, in order to, to address all of that, you need to think about how to collaborate with the third party solution and not develop everything by your own. And if you will develop everything by your own, it will have a lot of resources, human resources, a lot of budget, and a lot of pain because eventually the development can be 
damaged or can be not fit to the needs of the future of the future architecture, the future infrastructure, and the future um, solutions that you will want to expose to your customers. So in order to educate the customers about cybersecurity, um, you can do something that everybody do, uh, to sign uh, a papers or something like that, but then who will read them? You will yeah. sign up. Yep. You don't know that we are uploading data. You don't know that we are putting some security solutions on your car. You only sign, like you sign your mortgage and you sign a loan or something like that. So in order to educate, you need to make some movies or you need to make some videos. Yeah. Uh, you know what is awareness also on the IT. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it, it's a little, uh, I think, like the chicken and the egg syndrome. Uh, because I don't know the OEM or the manufacturer that will uh, form himself uh, spend money on providing uh, uh, cyber security uh, measures without anyone paying for it, okay? And then you go to the uh, operators, like uh, car operators or railway operators, and then they don't want to ask it because they don't believe it's needed. And then you go to the public, and nobody from the public asks for, from the operators, let's say the uh, Israeli civilians. They don't require from Israel Railways to provide them a railway with cybersecurity measures. Why? I don't know why. Maybe they don't know it's needed. But if they will know that the, the, there is a problem, and someone can derail a train and kill their family, when they are driving, you know, my family is, driving, uh, is riding the train almost every day. If the public will require from the operator, like Israel Railways, to supply him cyber security measures in this public transportation, then Israel Railways will go, will go to their OEM in Europe and require it in the tender. And then the OEM will be, he will, he will be uh, um, obliged to supply such a solution. So it's like the chicken and the egg. Yeah. The, the, no other way, it's like a circle. Go for it. It's like a digital transformation, okay? So eventually you have the, we have the, the vehicle, the traditional vehicle not connected, and we didn't have a lot of requirements, yeah, from the tier one. And for sure that now in the connected vehicle, we have a lot more requirements that dealing with cybersecurity. The regulation in the US talked about securing the vehicle. The regulation in the EU don't, don't talk about securing the vehicle yet, but they will be. In order to address the debt, you will need to secure the vehicle from now. So the so. Europe is definitely approaching it from the data side of things. Yeah. They're looking at the integrity of everything that you have and how do they protect it through the system. Mm -hmm. The US is definitely looking at the device and the system and the integrity of it itself. Yeah, it's a different approach. But it's, I mean, in theory, both get there. It's just which one is going to actually be more effective in the short, medium, and long. We're running into the same thing. Bo and the crew are going to be talking about that on healthcare and everything. So, and Nina and everything. So that's going to be fascinating as well. So with short-term mitigation, and lurk term mitigation. And yeah. It's also collaboration with the tier one and oh, the OEM. Exactly. And and it's it come, to me it also comes down to the awareness again. It's we don't necessarily know we need it, unfortunately, until something occurs or something happens. It's I will give and this is one thing definitely, I will give the automotive industry a huge amount of kudos, a lot of kudos, because they've listened for the most part. I mean we had the incident with the Fiat Chrysler group GM's listened, Audi's listened, Mercedes has, Ford eventually listened. They've taken their time and they've brought us on board, whereas at least in the US, the trains are useless. They haven't listened. And obviously, we have problems with aviation. They're still, some of them are still challenged. Um, so it's really nice to see the automotive side actually stepping up and going, look, we actually want to look after the people here. So it's kind of nice. I, I think we can say that today we have two standards, two ISO standards. One is still a draft, 21 for 34, and the other yep. one is safety, 26, 26, 2. So those both are going to make any way the market evolve. Now, again, I remember, uh, I will not say which CEO, but the CEO of an OEM saying just before a weekend, and maybe, you know, in order to boost a little bit the sales, we're going to do a lot of great business out of the data that the drivers are giving to us <laughs> in the cars. That was just before the weekend. 
Mohican. I believe he was not meaning to do anything wrong by doing that. Now, what happened is on Twitter, he had more than 40,000 tweets saying it looks like the CEO of Beep has not learned from the, um, the mistakes of the CEO of Facebook. Yeah. And that was more than 40,000 tweets during the weekend. I think this is great because this means that the customers are not going to be willing to move anyway in, in the connected cars without proper prevention of threats before. And I agree with you, it will never, never be 100%, but at least, again, the OEMs and the, the uh, tier ones yeah, right. have to make sure that they do everything they can so that it's cyber secure by design. Right. So I'm actually going to do final comments, if you don't mind. Awesome. So if you don't mind, I'd love final thoughts and final comments from each one of you, and then we'll wrap up and hand off to the prof. We are going to run, as long as everybody's still OK, we are going to run into the break. So you'll get five minutes for coffee. So it'll be get your asses up, get coffee, and come snick back. Sound good? Yeah. Good. All right. Please, final comments, if you don't mind. Um, so very quickly on our side, because we run a security fund and we've been running it since 2006, I think the one thing I would leave you with is the speed of change and what we've seen when we launched the fund in 2006. First of all, nobody really understood what safety meant and cybersecurity for people back then was like uh, people hacking to get famous. Like it wasn't about ransomware today and all the kind of really liabilities that you see today. And I, in that same train of thought, I want you to think also about 5G, about quantum computing, there's a, the, a section, I think, tomorrow on that. The speed at which computers are going to be able to, uh, you know, uh, assimilate all this data that's going to be available, and it's no longer just a GPS of where you're located, but it's where you're going, where you're coming from, who you're with, how much you're talking about, the speed of quantum, and we're not there yet. Maybe Google has the highest speed, but we still need to get to 2,000 qubits before you can use it. But all those technologies, edge, quantum, 5G, you just have to think forward and ahead of how quickly things are changing and how the, the, the Internet of Things and that speed in just uh, consumer, not just corporate, is going so fast that you have to get ready for that. And I think cyber is just going to be such a key, um, you know, it's an opportunity on one hand because everything is faster and interconnected, but it's also a huge liability and a huge risk that you need to address sooner rather than later. Cool. I will finish by saying that uh, I'm uh, more optimistic than I was uh, three years ago uh, because uh, three years ago when I spoke about uh, cyber threats to the railway industry people thought uh, that we were crazy <laughs> people thought that uh, there is no way that someone can hack such a system and today when we speak about it we, we see that the OEMs and the operators are beginning to listen more and more and uh, I think that in one year, it will be like in the car industry, and uh, it will be mandatory to have cybersecurity measures in, the, in, su in such a critical industry. Thank you. Next. Yeah, maybe my final... Oops. Thank you. That's better? Yeah. So maybe my final kind of comment, and that's not my thought. So I attended a unique event yesterday of Team 8, and what they shared is the following. And I found it pretty uh, interesting. Is it's obvious that you should control and own your own data, right? It's your data, it's your privacy, and that's a given. Even you know, after you eventually leave this planet, it should always be your own data. Then the second step is, if it's your data, you should also be free to monetize it if you wish so. And it shouldn't be left to other firms or people to make money out of your data. It should be your choice and it should be your money. Okay, that's my thought. I, I, I would say as a conclusion that, uh, you know, CISOs have been willing for years to uh, say that uh, cybersecurity was not a cost center, but was a, uh, a center of revenues. Now, we know that cybersecurity within cars, planes, trains, whatever it is, this is going to be a product that is sold, and it must be as a product. It, it must be a quality product. It must be uh, in some way tested. It must be, again, again, designed properly and so on. But that is for sure something that we sell. And everybody is, is going to buy it, either included into the price of the vehicle, hopefully, uh, or maybe some things maybe add on. Uh, I don't think that's possible, but why not? Uh, but in any way, it is a product that we sell, and it is a center of revenues for everybody. You're up, sir. So, I will address to what you are saying at the moment. So I think that as long as we are exposing some services, we need to protect our vehicle. Okay. So the connected vehicle will be connected to our line, to our cloud, and eventually we need to protect it. Protect it or detect it. 
we have closed vehicle and then we have connected vehicle. When we make it or produce it to be connected vehicle, we need to put some highs on the, ve on the vehicle itself. We didn't know that there is some attacks. Now we need to know and observe the attack and then to mitigate and to know how we are addressing to that. So it's, it's levels and then some layers for sure in the vehicle and then out of the vehicle. Awesome, thank you very, very much. Um, please give the five amazing people here a round of hands. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Much appreciated for an awesome conversation. All right, we have about a 10 second break and where's the prof? <laughs> All right, hang on, everybody sit down. Everybody sit down. We still have one more lecture. Please give them your time and then everybody can go for coffee.